Russian air forces were not long ago considered the third strongest in the world. They have strategic bombers, nearly a thousand fighters and various seemingly high-tech weaponry. Yet, as we saw during the past several months, the Russian Air Force hasn't really exploited that perceived air superiority. They struggled with even controlling the airspace, and actually using the airspace to provide firepower from above proved to be an elusive goal. This video will try to explain why that is. First up, two short shoutouts. Armchair Historian YouTube channel made a video game, Fire and Maneuver, a strategy game made by history buffs. It's out on July 15th, so feel free to check out the Steam link below our video. Unrelated to that, wanna surprise someone with a weird t-shirt? Or just become a proud wearer of our bad motherfucker bink of tea? We've also got other bink of classic teas to choose from, and they're all on sale. So give them all a look and check out our link below the video description. Now onto our video. There are several reasons for Russian performance, but the biggest ones are doctrinal and technological. The Russian Air Force never was configured to provide ample ground strikes, supporting its own military the way the US power is. And striking behind enemy lines is something the Russian Air Force is especially ill-equipped to do. First and foremost role of the Russian Air Force is one of air combat to try and keep enemy aircraft away, especially over Russian-owned territory, where layered sensor networks exist. While on paper Russia has in the last 15 years been procuring multi-role planes, capable of precision strikes, in reality those lack proper ancillary systems to operate as more than air combat planes. During the current war, the opposing air force has been mostly relegated to a nuisance. It still operates, likely from dispersed improvised runways and does a few interception sorties per day. NATO's AVAX aircraft are monitoring the western half of the battlefield and can warn of incoming Russian planes. That also complicates the issue for Russia. Russian Air Force is also likely still faced with a fair number of still operational enemy long-range SAMs, like the S-300. Finding those can be quite hard if they're used sparingly and if they rely on outside radars. Even when radars are lit, Russia doesn't have nearly as many aircraft for geolocation of radar signals, like the US does. Russia lacks tactical geolocating platforms for suppression of enemy air defenses that would dare to venture far over the enemy territory. The option of flying low to reach deep into enemy territory is also not an easy option for Russia. Not only does such a flight effectively half the combat radius of plane, but such incursions would be subject to countless shoulder-launched missiles. Deep strikes on enemy infrastructure are also not easy for the Russian Air Force. The opponent's territory is vast, and overflying so much territory on a regular basis can be quite dangerous. Unless the target is of strategic value, the gain might not be worth the risk. So those deep strikes haven't happened at the level the US air power did them in Iraq in 2003. Back then, the US-led coalition had more combat planes against a smaller country. Fewer flights over dangerous territory were needed. Much of western Iraq was flat desert, unsuitable for hiding SAM systems. In the current conflict, such targets like military production sites or air bases with powerful air forces may not even be plentiful anymore. Basically, Russia has a less favorable risk-to-gain ratio than the US when it comes to deep strikes. For the time being, Russia seems content generally operating near the front line. Though it's not as well stocked up with technology for such operations either as the US air power is. The technology used in Russian ground strike planes is more oriented towards striking predetermined or fixed targets. When it comes to actually searching and engaging relocatable targets on the battlefield, such as artillery, tanks, etc., the Russian Air Force is not very well suited for the job. To compound the issue, Russia is also lacking means to even observe the faraway targets from safe distances. There is the example of the Zatoka Bridge over Dniester River. It's one of crucial supply lines connecting Romania and Ukraine. Russia attacked it directly with cruise missiles on five separate occasions. Finally, the last attack damaged the bridge so badly that transport over it is not feasible, and repairing it quickly is also not possible. One takeaway was that a lot of the missiles either missed or malfunctioned. The other takeaway is time between repeated attack attempts, which was around one week. 
It's speculated that Russia at times simply lacks the assets to receive quick and timely battle damage assessment imagery. US cruise missiles have video feeds that stream back before impact. Russian missiles don't have that. Another way to do battle damage assessment is using recon planes from high altitude. But Russia, reliant on old Su-24MR, seems to lack recon platforms that can stay away at a safe distance and offer high-resolution images. Indeed, said plane did not move away much from Cold War recon performance levels. It was supposed to be replaced with modern recon pods meant for Su-34, but those are late in development by about a decade and have started production only last year. They are likely available in very small numbers. Finally, the number of recon satellites Russia has is fairly small, which may explain why sometimes a week is needed before a satellite of sufficient resolution can make it to the same spot over the Earth to monitor the area. It's also not known if Russia is indeed in position to receive satellite imagery from other countries. The Chinese government has been quite wary of providing any sort of even indirect help that could have a military impact. Another issue that's sometimes alleged is satellite navigation woes. Both in war in Syria and the current war, Russian Su-34 pilots were seen using commercial GPS navigation systems. Despite the fact Russia has a full constellation of satellites for navigation and that Russian hardware is supposed to use their signals. In reality, it may very well be that Russian signals are sporadic and not as accurate. Which may also explain why more than the expected number of Russian cruise missiles miss their targets. Finally, using a commercial navigation suite means its navigation data is not integrated into various battlefield data. One can imagine how inefficient that is. Knowing all these issues, imagine now attempts to find non-fixed targets like artillery pieces. If such a target, sometimes a few dozen kilometers behind enemy lines, is detected, it's plausible that Russian air forces simply can't mount an air attack against that target before such a target relocates. In the 1991 Gulf War, the US kill chain reaction time could at times take up to one day. By 2003, that time had famously fallen down. One of most famous examples was bombing attempt on Saddam Hussein, where a bomb struck just an hour after first information came in. Today, the US Air Force officials claim they can regularly strike a target within an hour or so, but have yet to achieve strikes in under 10 minutes. As for Russia, it seems their kill chain reaction abilities are closer to what the US had in 1991. And that's providing Russia can actually afford to risk planes in the air. As a side note, when targets are near the front line, Russians have at times shown their artillery can complete the kill chain much more quickly, once again showing that artillery is really the choice of fire support for Russians, not their air force. Of course, actually hitting tactical targets requires planes that can do so. Two plane types that have been seen over the battlefields the most are Su-25 and Su-34. They represent the best and most numerous means of providing tactical ground strikes but they're still quite a way behind the US air power and have serious limitations. Most of the Su-25 fleet, the base variant and the SM variants, has no proper optical target search device. That means the pilot needs to fly quite low to search for targets using his own eyes. Not only does that mean very few targets will be found, but such low and close flying is extremely dangerous, due to the number of enemy shoulder-launched missiles. The SM-3 variant is better, having a half-decent optical tracker with even a thermal channel, suitable for night ops, but their numbers are quite low. Su-34 as well as Su-24s do feature a built-in optical targeting system, but it's fairly old-tech. It lacks a thermal channel, making it unsuitable for nighttime ops, and even daytime ops in cloudy weather may have to be done from low level, under the clouds. Besides the fairly poor range, those optical systems also offer limited viewing angles, Using those to actually search for targets on their own is very hard. While some proper targeting pods were in recent years observed on Russian planes, it does not seem as if the Russian Air Force has yet procured those systems in meaningful numbers. So planes like Su-30, while they can drop guided bombs, are really relegated to going after fixed site targets, like infrastructure and so on. While various guided tactical missiles can be used against individual vehicles without timely targeting information, those aren't very useful. 
and using unguided bombs, even if helped by a computerized satnav site, is still fairly imprecise. Targets can of course be found and designated by other means. Army units on the front certainly report them, and indeed great majority of Russian airstrikes in the last several weeks have been just around the front lines. Indeed, those frontline support operations using targeting information collected by the army have been visibly more successful. Still, while the Russian military operates drones, those by and large have their own issues, precluding them from use deeper behind enemy lines, for example searching for enemy artillery. A great majority of the few thousand drones Russia uses are very small drones that simply lack endurance and sensors to be useful deep behind enemy lines. Of the types that could be useful, the big Orion drones seem decent enough, but they're still new and available in very, very small numbers, especially now after months of fighting. Russia does or did have a few hundred of medium-sized four-post drones, initially bought from Israel, then licensed assembled in Russia. But the thing is, even in 2009 when the deal was made, Israel would not sell top-of-the-line technology. So what Russia got was largely 1990s capabilities. Russia did eventually build its own local and improved variant, but that's been in low volume production since the 2020 and its numbers are still quite low. So overall it's likely Russia simply lacks the sensors over the battlefield to pursue time-critical targets behind enemy lines. Training and friend or foe identification issues are also likely affecting the Russian Air Force. A very robust communication and identification system must be in place to avoid most fratricides. Over the actual battlefield, there might be issues of Russian SAMs firing on their own planes, or Russian planes striking Russian-owned ground units. So Russia may be holding back in some situations where targets are unclear. Training is famously lacking in the Air Force. While the first half of the previous decade saw some improvements, money woes after the 2014 caused the flight training hours per year to once again take a dip. The US Air Force, for example, flew 170 hours in 2019, but it also had much more simulator training to add to those numbers. Of course, pilots that have not been optimally trained will have a harder time performing their missions. Aircraft are not the only way to strike from the air. The Russian military, Air Force included, also uses various cruise missiles and guided ballistic missiles. Those were used in this war and US intelligence says it tracked some 1400 Russian missiles fired by April 4th. In the same five and a half week period in Iraq 2003, the US used a slightly higher number of missiles. The US DOD stopped reporting on Russian missile launches mid-May, when those were close to 2200 missiles launched. But the US intelligence also assesses that only 40% of Russian missiles actually hit their targets. That figure includes various big items like cruise missiles and expensive Iskander ballistic missiles, but also some medium-sized air-launched missiles. While Russia is likely to have even a thousand Iskander ballistic missiles, and perhaps even a few thousand various cruise missiles, firing off a thousand such fairly expensive missiles is no small thing for Russia. Such weapons would otherwise be used against NATO. So Russia is very likely quite wary of expanding, say, half of their total inventory in the current conflict. Due to their price and complexity, such stocks may need years to be replenished. In these highly uncertain times, Russia is very likely holding back both in such missiles and in risking many of its high-end planes. They can't risk assuming the war won't escalate into a wider conflict involving NATO. In the current war, we were seeing fairly lethargic sortie raids from Russia at the start. It points to the Russian side not even expecting they would need a lot of air power. They thought the whole operation would not be a true war. On the other hand, since Russia could not be 100% sure how NATO would react, a lot of their planes were needed to protect the Russian western borders. Since then, we have seen Russia sending a bit more planes to the theater, with sortie rates, as tracked by US intelligence, reaching first 200 and recently even 300 sorties per day, flown over the battle theater. Some of those are bound to be non-combat sorties, and part of the combat ones are likely also fighter escort ones. It's not known how many actual strike sorties Russian air forces flew, but knowing usual rates from other air forces, it's likely to have been anywhere from 130 to 200 strike sorties per day. To put that in context, US coalition combat sortie rates per day during the 2003 invasion of Iraq were still a bit higher. 
and done over a smaller set of targets than presented to Russia. Being careful and risk-averse, Russian Air Force losses aren't that great. While various sources may claim much higher numbers, on May 26th, a US official said US intelligence estimates Russia lost almost three dozen fighter bomber planes and over 50 helicopters. Then again, that's a figure that takes two years for Russia to produce. All those target-finding issues explain why the Russian Air Force isn't flying much behind enemy front lines and risking their planes. The Air Force simply hasn't really made a big impact in the war. It's not equipped to do what the US Air Force does when it goes to war. Russian Air Force's role lies elsewhere. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.